So we got uh, six presenters today. Um, uh, TI, TI Cadence, Intel, Imagination, AMD, and uh, VeriSilicon. Did I say all the companies? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, we're going to have, I think every presenter will get about 10 to 12 minutes during the presentations. We'll probably take one or two questions. And we're going to have a and a session at the end uh, where all the speakers are going to come forward so you can ask the question. But if you have some question on a particular slide, feel free to ask that during the session. Right. Um, so let's get started. Now it's the three. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's been a good conference, a um, lot of learning. But this is coming to an end, and I don't want to be the guy standing between um, you know you and the happy hour. <laughs> so in next 10 minutes, I hope to update uh, all of you guys about uh, Texas Instruments OpenVX implementation. Jesse has been leading that project. He has um, uh, got me here uh, yesterday, uh, but I'm not regretting it. It's been a learning experience, and it's great to see you all. So um, before going into what our um, uh, implementation is, it will be apt to talk about what the platform looks like. It's, it's a heterogeneous uh, platform with the purpose-built course uh, to solve different classes of uh, image processing, ADAS uh, kind of automotive, uh, automotive problems. So there are four key components. If you you know if you can go through all of uh, the text here and abstract it out, the first key component is the core, which can uh, do processing on low-level uh, pixel kind of data and just repeat it again and again and, and keep doing it. So sort of single instruction, multiple data kind of architecture. We call that um, we gave that a name. Uh, that core, and it's called Eve Embedded Vision Engine. So you'll come across this um, this term again and again uh, during the presentation. So it'll be nice to remember it. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, low-level processing could also be done on uh, DSP. Then there are mid-level processing uh, cores which can handle tasks like optical flow, image stitching, and, and stuff like that uh, quite well. Um, the other two components um, of the architecture are, uh, you know, one of them is quite simple to understand. Um, something like ARM or DSP that, um, that the job is to do high level processing, <coughs> sort of classification. Uh, not deep learning, but let's say the decision trees and, and that sort of classification. Um, and the last one, the last and the fourth component is purpose built hardware accelerators. So they may be doing things like uh, deep learning, metrics, multiplication, acceleration, um, things like image signal processing, and so on. So four key components, and as all of this is built for automotive, so of course it needs to have its um, fundamental structure based in safety, et cetera. So this is the context that uh, I hope you can remember uh, through rest of uh, the seven minutes, eight seconds that I'm left with. <laughs> so. Um, <coughs> Jesse chose the name, TIOVX. Uh, it's an OpenVX uh, implementation on TI SOCs. And there are two uh, vectors, of course, to achieve maximum performance without spending a lot of time doing the implementation. So that's the goal we had in mind, so that users can easily maximize performance on the platform while using the OpenVX interface, uh, you know, without spending writing all that assembly code that, that you know, sometimes or most of the times we end up doing. And how that's achieved is, uh, I, I think there has been a lot of discussion on the graph-based models and, and the virtual buffer, so I won't go really deep into that, except for, you know, we support it by having uh, definition of the graph at uh, init time to ensure optimal runtime and latency. And of course, we want to ensure that all the on-chip memory that we have is utilized to the fullest. So we don't have too many uh, DDR runs. Um, the key part, though, is, is the three things in the middle. Now, this is a heterogeneous architecture. Again, going back to the last slide, there is Eve DSP. So there are purpose-built cores. So the kernels are written and optimized um, for that architecture automatically. Now, the compute is only as good as the memory accesses. So um, the DMA 
integration is uh, is part of the implementation. So the tiled accesses are most optimal. They are coalesced. You you don't have to do uh, you don't have to write them at all. So it's abstracted out for the users. And and all these five pieces in general are trying to ensure that the whole compute is used to the maximum without too much uh, memory access. Now, what about the development cost part? So the software is, is of course, abstracted. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go deeper, one level deeper into this. Could be Linux or Artos, any of that. Uh, of course, the, we are uh, confirmant to the OpenVX 1.1 standard. The application works across uh, a family of SOCs. Um, and, and I think the key part is, is again, the last two points, the ease of use. So users could uh, do the whole development on the PC. You don't need the target platform and use the exact same code and recompile it for the target. Um, now, if you already have OpenVX code written, uh, that will work. But if you don't and you are building a graph from this from scratch, then there is um, this tool that the um, team has built. It's called... Uh, Pi T I O V X. <laughs> Sorry about the tongue twister here, but you know I can assure you that using this tool is much easier than actually pronouncing the name. <laughs> so um, the, uh, we'll go one step deeper. But the idea behind this tool is to generate Open V X uh, application code from from baseline, and of course, uh, eventually the result of the implementation is full entitlement on T I SOCs achieve maximum performance, seamless access to uh, each of the heterogeneous cores uh, through single OpenVX interface. That's the idea. You, know, you don't need multiple interfaces for heterogeneous cores because that sometimes is the grouse of, uh, of users, that uh, it's a good SOC, but the programming model is too complex. So that's the problem we intend to solve. OK, so. Um, Again, we, it's a family of SOCs, TDA2, TDA2 Eco, and TDA3X. If you go to the website, you will uh, get information on what these are. Uh, the TI OVX supports the full uh, SOC family on different cores. You can see there are different ARM A15, DSP, again, these EV engines, which are, which are single instruction, multiple data kind of thing. It's uh, supported across uh, multiple different RTOSs or Linux, depending upon uh, which SOC you're using. And of course, uh, these SOCs also scale across the range of ADAS applications that I listed here. Um, so the idea is, you know, if, if a user is designing for front camera analytics versus rear camera, they can build on the same kernel, uh, choose the SOC that, that fits their need, and, and still uh, have the interface, use the same interface without writing the code again. OK, so this is going to take about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and since I only have two minutes, so I'll run very quickly through that. Um, I think the, what we are showing is a distributed TI OVX graph for a really complex front camera application. Uh, and and there, is, there is a bunch of abbreviations here. But the key part is uh, probably on the left. So you see a camera link and a display link, uh, which is bookending the TI OVX compute in, in the middle. So the camera link and, and display links, the, this is uh, enable, enabling pipelining outside OpenVX at this point. Um, and it's built using TI SDK. Um, the OVX compute uh, builds this whole graph. And uh, right now, it's, this is an example mapping it to different processing cores, the red being ARMS, the blue, sky blue being DSPs, and two different greens being e or or a hardware accelerator. And, and how the data flows in this particular structure. The key point being that the implementation allows distributed execution uh, for better utilization across the course. And there is no intervention from the CPU. So as you would notice, the CPU is just sitting idle, uh, which means that, uh, which is a good thing or a bad thing. You can use it for something else, uh, of course, uh, during that time frame. And, um, of course, uh, we do enable data IO acceler acceleration and tiling support through DMA and virtual buffers while keeping it abstracted from users. And you know, if you're wondering what these, these pieces are, 
these are typical ADAS algorithms uh, that, that we are mapping to different sort of cores. Okay, uh, as promised, we are back to the tongue twister. PyTI OVX. It's an uh, automated uh, OpenVX C code generation tool. So um, if you are defining a graph from scratch, you start here. So basically you define a graph in, 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 in a format. So you, you write maybe a 20, 30 line code. And what the tool does is two things. It generates the C code that can run on SOC without modifications. At least that's the promise. Um, but more importantly, uh, you can visualize the graph connections that you're making, which means you, you can actually see how the data flow is going to look like. So this picture that we tried to build here, you will see a version of it uh, after you write uh, the description. And that, uh, our experience is that it, it helps. Looking at it from, um, looking at a picture uh, helps solve a um, lot of issues earlier uh, rather than later. Of course, there are some assertions built uh, or are in process of being built, is what Jesse told me. Um, and, and which will mean that even before um, we reach this point, uh, the tool itself will give you some ideas if you're making an, an obvious mistake in choosing a buffer or, or uh, defining the data flow. So in summary, uh, the red light is on. <laughs> so I'm over. Uh, the TIOVX will be available uh, on this web page soon, and I think soon is weeks rather than months. Uh, the implementation does support uh, multi-core heterogeneous compute using all our cores, ARM, DSP, EVE, as well as purpose-built hardware accelerators. It supports distributed graph execution. It supports DMA acceleration um, and pipeline camera display with uh, support from uh, external TI SDK based components. The hardware abstractions that we have built in allow OpenVX implementation to run on you know any kind of ARM CPU, whether it's a big one or a small one, translation Linux or RTOS. And ease of use, so do the development on PC, uh, do most of the debug there, and then seamlessly come over to the target and make it run. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so I've got a few slides on what Cadence uh, provides for OpenVX. We just announced a couple of weeks ago the availability of our, what we call APK, uh, version 4.0. Uh, so we've been working on this for a while, but this is the first one that is actually compliant to the OpenVX standard. Uh, just a little bit about Cadence. Uh, so Cadence, uh, well, Tensilica is a portion of Cadence that uh, licenses DSP IPs for use on uh, SOCs, for, so our customers are SOC vendors typically. Um, we have uh, 250 licensees shipping over 4 billion uh, devices. Uh, we're the top choice for audio DSPs, and the vast majority of the top semiconductor companies are using us, so you should be too. Um, and so I'm going to show, uh, so we have a line of, of DSPs, uh, like we said, uh, top and audio. Uh, now we have uh, uh, these devices, uh, now we're on the third generation or fourth generation of uh, vision and video devices. Uh, and uh, this APK uh, runs on the latest of those. So uh, we provide this uh, application programming kit, which is, is basically our name for our uh, OpenVX implementation. And there's four main components that you can see by the major bullets here. There's a front end, which is the API itself. So like when you call the C code, uh, it needs to get run, uh, need to, needs to run on our target. So or on, on our, uh, uh, it needs to do the right thing for our implementation. So we've got that. Uh, then there's the graph mapper. And that's the thing that when you call verify graph and it does all of the, uh, the optimizations, it, in addition to verifying the graph, it figures out uh, what things it can say uh, tile and chain or what kernels it can fuse and where it should put all the, the memory and all of that magic happens uh, in the graph mapper and that's what's invoked when you call um, you call verify graph in our implementation. Uh, 
then we have a runtime. So the when the graph mapper is done, it it writes out a what we call a binary script, which says in detail exactly what the target has to do in terms of what DMA, uh, what the tile size is, uh, what the alignment is, and all the memory locations and all of that stuff, is embedded in this binary script that has the details of exactly what's going to happen. And a runtime, uh, this is what, uh, when you call schedule graph in our implementation, uh, it invokes the runtime on a particular binary script associated with that compiled graph and uh, runs it uh, efficiently. And it handles all of the communication with the DSP target. So I'll show a, a, a block diagram in a minute, but the general uh, configuration would be a host uh, with the DSP target. Um, and then uh, finally we have a set of uh, uh, what we call the XI library, uh, which is uh, highly optimized, hand-optimized kernels that, that run all of the, say, the 40-some-odd uh, the kernels that are in the OpenVX uh, implementation, plus actually there's, there's quite a few more. This is the machine, or one of the machines that it runs on. So the uh, Vision P6 is a VLIW five-way machine. Uh, that uh, each of the instructions in that uh, f of those five uh, five words uh, can be a vector instruction of 50, 512 uh, uh, bytes each. So um, anyway, you can get a lot done in uh, in in a single cycle. Uh, this is a block diagram of a typical system on which you'd run our APK. So on the left-hand side, you see the host. And actually, a lot of the code, most of the code <laughs> is running on the host in terms of your, your API, your application program runs on the host. Uh, the API uh, then that builds all of the graph runs on the host. And then the verify graph, eventually you'll call verify graph, and that'll invoke the graph mapper on the far left, uh, which will emit a binary script. Uh, that is ready for the runtime. And then you'll call process graph, which will poke the host runtime and uh, basically communicate to the DSP to say, here, please run this binary script uh, and let me know when you're done. Uh, and so the host can go off and do something else. Uh, and then the DSP will uh, uh, sort of autonomously from the host do the entire graph, including uh, uh, DMAing and the various tiles, launching all of the kernels, DMAing the results back out, making sure that the DMAs and the, and the computes are overlapped so that you're doing all of this stuff efficiently. And it'll be doing that using the DMA and, and XI libraries uh, and, and then sending the message back to the, uh, back to the host. All of the light blue text that you see here is the, the, the part of the APK. Uh, so it's part of what you get delivered uh, when when you get uh, get the APK, which comes when if you license the device, the, the the processor core, you get all of this stuff. So uh, some some points. It's uh, fully compliant to uh, OpenVX 1.1. Uh, we're using the XI library, uh, and each one of those uh, those library kernels, there's performance benchmarks that that um, uh, tell you basically cycles per pixel for each of those those functions, uh, and I have to sort of tell you up front right now we're working on the sort of end-to-end -end benchmarks with some more of the uh, full graphs that we can show you, uh, you know, to what extent there is overhead, uh, and that is uh, a work in progress, um, but something that's a very high priority for us, and I know it is for our customers as well. Um, and it does this automatic tiling, and, and, and we have, for example, a scatter-gather uh, special purpose hardware, and whenever that's, it makes sense to use that, it just uses that automatically. You don't even have to know it's there. Uh, it, uh, it accelerates your, your uh, application. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and so it's running on both the P5 and P6, the exact same code, uh, exact same graphs. So you can run on P5 and P6. When you run on P6, it'll run faster because it's just going to take advantage of, of the extra stuff that's there. Um, and if you license uh, the, the IP, uh, you get our APK and you get source code for the whole thing, including the XI libraries, the DMA libraries, the IP libraries, and uh, the graph mapper, all of it. Uh, so if uh, you want to run on a, a, your SOC has, you know, a different way of doing IPC or you have different resources you want uh, to manage, then you have the source code to be able to do all of that. Uh, so you're familiar, I think, from today, this example application. Uh, the only thing for me to point out now is that, uh, well, this, this, the, the graph that runs 
uh, on this APK is unmodified from the graph that you've been running on your PCs. It's exactly the same code, and it runs uh, doing all of that DMA and tiling and other, other stuff that, uh, that has to be done on this embedded device. Uh, so what do you get? Well, what you get, uh, so if you're working with a uh, Tensilica device uh, and using our IDE, the, there's a thing, a workspace, which basically has all of the, the uh, source code and other resources that you might de need to do for development. And so you get uh, a, a workspace where, uh, in this case, what we call a single core bare metal, where everything runs on a single uh, P5 or P6 DSP, and that actually includes what I showed on all the host, right? It's all just C code, and I can compile it for this DSP. So this, this allows you to uh, basically do some, some quick development and quick simulation. Uh, it's where you should start if you get, get our APK. Uh, the other option uh, is where we actually simulate the whole dual core, where there's uh, a, a controller running Linux uh, that is, is booting and then communicating with the, the uh, P5 or 6 DSP. Uh, and all of that is, is simulated uh, in a Linux environment. So um, basically you get the, the, the kind, same kind of thing that you would see on the target when you actually deploy it in most situations. Um, and you'll get uh, this, this example, uh, and you'll be able to just build it and run it. It's got some extra stuff for getting and, and uh, sort of reading and writing the images uh, and some uh, release notes. Basically there's four files in a zip file that you get <laughs> if, you, if you pick up our package. Uh, and that's that's what I have. So, uh, is, any questions about uh, the Cadence implementation? Yeah. Why would the benchmark be available? <laughs> Uh, so, the, uh, like I said, the, the kernel ones are under development right now. And so the benchmarks that we're working on for full graphs, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I, I hesitate to, to answer, but I would say it's a matter of weeks before we, we get that. Um, it's a top priority for the people in my team to get at least something you know, and, and have a, a sort of a, a, a sanity check so that you all can see that we're doing what we're, we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks. Thanks, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Chris Longstaff from Imagination. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Imagination is an IP uh, provider we provide multiple types of IP, CPU, communications IP, multimedia IP uh, for SOCs. And uh, shipped over three billion Power VR cores now in product, so it's uh, widely out there. Key markets, mobile, automotive, consumer, IoT, anything embedded really. And uh, all of the, the Power VR GPUs that are shipping today, that are available today are supporting OpenGL ES, Vulkan, OpenCL, and of course, OpenVX. And I, I think some of you may know uh, our OpenVX implementation already. What I really wanted to talk about today was optimizing OpenVX and some of the tools that we use. And so some of this is what we do internally in terms of uh, optimizing OpenVX, but I think it's a useful insight for how to optimize OpenVX uh, overall. So, obviously a lot of uh, what people think about OpenVX is that it's automatically all going to be optimized, and that's obviously not the, uh, the case. So, a lot of it comes down to your implementation of the driver. So, you know, the driver that the uh, OpenVX provider supplies to you is going to determine a lot as to how good that optimization is. And also, you bear in mind, you know, the, the TI presentation just then pointing out that OpenVX can target many different types of uh, hardware, and each type of hardware will have some things that are optimal for it. So if you're using, let's say, just a GPU in the system, just being aware of the kind of data types and the source of things there is going to be uh, useful. So really understanding that the specific application on the platform as a designer of an OpenVX application is going to help you have uh, an optimal uh, implementation. And obviously one of the things that we need to do as a company uh, in order to uh, maximize that performance is to be able to measure it. So because we're very much GPU centric uh, today in terms of the, the Power VR OpenVX implementation, we've developed a lot of tools over the time uh, significantly obviously for OpenGL type implementations for graphics, 
but a lot of these are equally applicable to OpenVX. They're showing the, the usage of the GPU, the usage of the CPU, and by analyzing these, it helps us in our driver development to understand the bottlenecks. And also, if you're implementing an application on our GPUs, you can download these tools and you can see where the bottlenecks might be in your application as well and even feed that back to us. It may be something that you can do with your application or it might be something that we need to do with our driver to improve uh, the performance. So I'm just taking a very, very simple use case for, uh, to describe the, sort of the problem here, a very, very simple lane departure warning. So I'll bring up the graph in a minute and we're just gonna show what we have before we optimize the graph, after we optimize the graph and how the tools are, are helping us uh, do that. So this is a, a very much simplified graph, but showing the main blocks, obviously everything from the input image there to the Hoff lines at the output. So multiple different stages here. So extracting the different channels, combining them, using some of the primitives like the, the Sobel, the phase, uh, canny edge detector. And then anyone who might have been here last year might have remembered me describing the Hoff lines, user node and how we went about that. You can probably still find that on the Kronos website somewhere, which has got our description of that, that Hoffline's implementation. So that's a user node. And looking then at how we now want to look at this graph as a whole, how can we optimize this? So the first stage is, is looking at some results in terms of this measurement with the, uh, the driver turned off. And, and what we see here, uh, you can see, there's a lot of idle periods within the GPU here. Obviously what we want to do is try to minimise it. And you see obviously these are all the sequential operations that are uh, happening. You can't quite read it very well here, but the channel extraction, uh, the canny there, Sobel and phase there. So it's all happening sequentially. Obviously very, very inefficient. So what we do with the driver, uh, we need to optimise all of those processes. And so if you remember, this is uh, how we were here, so lots of separate operations, lots of things happening in parallel, and what we need to do then is change those into a block. So we now get a single block here for the conversion, so encompassing all of those, and combine the Sobel and Phase together. So just sort of going back there again, uh, you see you've got the, the things there that are combined together, and I know now why I never do animated slides because I always forget how I've animated it uh, and uh, we've combined together. So what we can do then is look at the, uh, the results now. And what we see here, you know, there's still obviously gaps in terms of where the GPU is, but there's much, much more density here, much smaller gaps. And this, you know, the task completion phase has been reduced by 50% as we've combined all of these operations. So obviously, if you are implementing a real-world application, you could use our uh, graph tool to, um, to look at that, understand, you know, are you getting very good utilization of our GPU for this? Are there big gaps? And then once we understand that, we can look with you at whether are those things that you could improve in terms of your application, or are those things that should be improved uh, in terms of our driver? So, you know, just quick summary here. Obviously, it is a uh, OpenVX does allow platform portability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll optimize exactly the same way on, on every platform. We do make the best to try to optimize, um, you know, any graph uh, for our GPU efficiently. So make sure that that's done for GPU, and we have the tools available there to help you optimize, and they're freely downloadable uh, from our website. So thank you for your time there. If there's any uh, questions now, I can uh, attempt to answer those. Yes, yes, sorry, I, I kind of missed uh, exactly what transformation you had to do. You had your tools that was showing you these idle cycles, and then you're doing some sort of transformation to the graph that kind of like, you know, you can cut some of the idle cycles out. So what's the transformation that you had to do? To so, so what happens is, instead of doing all of these in discrete steps, so the extraction of the red, the green, the blue, adding some of them together and subtraction, 
doing the solo and the phase here as sequential processes, we're able to combine those and effectively do them within a, a single operation. So because of the, the nature of those operations, we can combine them together and effectively do them as a single part of the graph because we know, so we, we're directly feeding, obviously, these together into a single operation. Now, in terms of lower level detail than that, I don't really know the precise. I see, so that was kind of my question, if you didn't make changes to the, uh, to the graph description and, and, and the... So, no, so, so the, in terms of the graph description, you know, you, you can describe the graph effectively like this at a high level. It's the driver that will then automatically take that high level graph and optimize it and create the, the execution on the GPU. So this, that will effectively be done seamlessly. So what happens is you've described the graph like this. In effect, what we actually execute on the GPU is a combined uh, cycle and phase and a combined conversion block. You look more confused now yes. than, than before. So. I mean, how would the user, how, how would the user? So you, you said you have to make changes to the driver. No, no, so, so the, sorry. What, what I mean is that the driver has automatically got these optimizations built in. It, what I'm saying is, if, um, and we've basically analyzed how to do things, how to, to, to bring things together. So that's the job of the driver, is to take the graph and optimize it for the target hardware and then play that graph through on the target hardware. Now, all I was trying to say was that if we analyze things like this and we look at this, then we may take a particular application that someone's designed and we look at this and go, oh, actually, this still isn't very good. Are there some further things we do? And it maybe just limits that, no, that's the best we can do on the hardware. Uh, that, that's the way it is. It may be that we do need to go back and say, actually, maybe there are some further you know, tweaks we can do to our driver. But for a given version of the driver, it will automatically you know, optimize um, everything that we know that we can do. Yeah. So are you saying that, 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 that looking at the use case, you optimized your driver, and the result of the driver was what we saw at the end. When a new user does it again, he'll, he'll, he'll get all the benefit of your input driver. No, I, I think I'm maybe confused. What, what I'm saying is we've spent a lot of time working out how to optimize open VX graphs, mm -hmm. and we've made a driver, an open VX driver, yeah. that automatically optimizes. And all I'm saying is, in future revisions of the driver, you know, may, maybe today we're working, let's say, on DDK version 1.5. Maybe DDK version 1.6, we've managed to introduce some additional optimizations. But, but everyone who's using DDK 1.5 will get automatically the optimizations. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So he's going to use Chrome to present his. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I had the presentation ready, but it seems that it didn't pass the full process in Intel, so I cannot show it. But I can show you what is already passed, which is the web page. Okay, so we talked about it already in the, let's it come up. In the discussion, we use only one, uh, in the tutorial, one tool, which is the uh, model optimizer. Um, so it also contains an OpenVX implementation. It's beta, so it's still not that stable, but it's still working. Um, and it has some development tools, like you can actually picture, take the uh, uh, GUI and have the graphs. You can actually pick and drag a uh, open VX nodes, connect them together, push a button, you get a, a code which is ready. Uh, it contains more than open VX, it contains also open CV and other tools for computer vision, but, for, uh, but still it has also a runtime for open VX. And it has also, it is connected to VTune, so you can actually look and add the node into the details and see where the bottlenecks are and understand uh, if you have a, um, user node, in that case it's a, a device kernel nodes which are OpenCL. Um, you'll be able to see where the bottlenecks are and how they are uh, in the graph executed and where the bottlenecks are. So 
Um, if people want to know, people ask about what uh, hardware. So it says here that it's uh, on the six family and on the atom family. And it supports also the iris. So that's all. Any questions for Tom? Why wouldn't Intel let you show the original presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Technical thing, it just, uh, the lawyers didn't scan it yet. <laughs> is, this, is this free for download? Yes, this is public, completely public. If I can access this, it's public. So we can generate OpenDX code for any implementation using it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in, in fact, I think his, uh, the, the, the README on the USB stick has the procedure how to download it and generate OpenVX code for a given CNN model, right? AlexNet in this particular case. Okay, I'm Mike Schmidt from uh, AMD, and our version of OpenVX has been shipping as open source for a little over a year. Uh, and I'm going to show you today a little bit different than what everyone did. Oh, yes. Sorry about that. I'm going to show you a little bit different than what everyone else, because everyone sort of has been through a few presentations. You've been here all day. You sort of know what OpenVX is. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our OpenVX quickly and then tell you something that we actually did with it. And it's all free and open source, and you can go and get that. OK, so our design goals uh, was we wanted to make a open source version of OpenVX. We wanted to run an x86 CPU as well as our GPUs using OpenCL. And you can do that. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. It runs uh, on pure CPU only, or it runs on GPU for almost 100% of the functions, not quite. Or you can make it do mixed, right? So you can choose all that. Uh, we wanted to make really easy tools for you being able to quickly prototype and debug your code. And so what we did was we actually created a scripting language that you can actually go in and you just describe your nodes and what your data is, and then that's it. You don't even have to compile it. It just runs that as an interpreter uh, in the graph building step, and then it just executes the graph. And you can go in and do, do a lot of debugging things and, and stuff with that. And we also put through in uh, OpenCV interoperate Ability. So you can take almost anything that's an OpenCV and encapsulate it into an OpenVX node. So people should pretty much be able to use that to do, uh, you know, a large uh, amount of uh, prototyping and, and actual product development. Uh, so how fast does it run? Well, that's one thing I couldn't get the lawyers to actually also uh, say, but it runs really fast. Uh, <laughs> That's a legal term, by the way. <laughs> and it runs really fast on Ryzen. So everyone knows our, our Ryzen CPUs just came out, and they're really fast. Uh, you can see lots of benchmarks on those. We get uh, a speed up over our competitor there on Ryzen single thread of uh, between, or uh, typically about 10 or 20% at same clock speeds, and up to like 50% and 100% faster on some of the nodes. So it just depends on which nodes you're running. And as everyone knows, there's like, there's about 200 different functions when you take the 40 functions and scale it up to all the different uh, versions. Uh, we also include a code generator for the uh, GPU for OpenCL. So, for example, if you're doing convolutions, uh, you, you know, more than just like 3 by 3 that's in the spec, and you want to do something, you know, bigger than that, we can automatically generate code for that that's optimized. And we have a graph optimizer, so that was some of the questions that were we're going on before. Same thing that other people do uh, when you actually do a verified graph. We go in and optimize the graph. We fuse things. We throw out stuff that's not ever used. Uh, we uh, actually generate better code if it's on the uh, GPU. We will automatically pick previously hand-optimized kernels that exist to actually use them for specific uh, variants of different kernels. But the, uh, the new thing is uh, this 360 video stitching, right? So a little over a year ago, an actual real partner came to us and said, oh, uh, we have a real application for you, and uh, can you do this? And the idea was to build a big camera rig uh, and shoot a VR movie. 
and be able to stitch it in real time so that the director of the movie could actually see what was coming from all those cameras live. Because previous to this, uh, and almost still exclusively, most people that film uh, high quality uh, Hollywood type movies, they're filming with cameras that just record and you don't even know if it recorded until hours later when you try to go stitch it all together. So this is actually a set of the movie Bahubali 2, just came out last weekend. Uh, it's a big movie in India, not so big here, but uh, I think the Bahubali 1 was the top grossing film in India uh, at the time when it came out a couple years ago. So we'll see in a couple weeks how big this was. But you can see our camera there up on that boom like 40 feet in the air or something. It's got 24 cameras initially. We added four more, so there's actually 28 cameras coming off of this. And we can take those with our OpenVX stitching uh, solution and stitch them in real time and preview them on a headset using a single PC with a single graphics card. So these are the basic features of that uh, implementation. It's th these kernels only run on GPU. Uh, up to 8K by 4K stitch resolution. Uh, we can't do 28 cameras at 8K. We, could, we do those at 4K. Uh, up to 32 cameras altogether. Uh, you know, lots of other features. For example, uh, we do virtual cameras. So if you wanted to actually have a VR camera in this room uh, and you're actually taking a picture of the slides, it wouldn't really come out that good because you're grabbing uh, you know, with a camera, what's on the screen. You could feed the camera feed directly in and make a virtual camera and put the uh, PowerPoint over on the side wall in the actual VR space. Uh, and, and that's basically a free feature because uh, you're, just re you're just inserting pixels just like it came from another camera. And it can run in real time in offline modes. Uh, this is what the overall architecture looks like. Uh, the green parts are what we're calling this uh, Radeon Loom. Uh, product. You can see our OpenVX layer that's in there, uh, as well as some OpenCL and a lot of other uh, components that all sort of come together and make this into one cohesive product. And so, questions? I actually finished early. I, uh, both those projects are completely open source, uh, uh, free to use for anyone as well. Yes. So, did you use the like the standard OpenVX nodes, or did you have to create? Yeah, we had to create. We had to create some new nodes. So, we we created maybe a dozen new nodes uh, altogether, and a lot of them are uh, you know things like multiband blending. So they're they're similar to a lot of things that are in OpenVX, but they're not quite big enough or powerful enough or you know whatever. Yes. So it seemed like that would be a lot of compute. Was that a single GPU device, or was that several GPU devices used together? One, one single GPU. Matter of fact, even, it even runs on like a couple-year-old GPU. Uh, what was the question? You said one GPU. Uh, doesn't that depend on the number of cores? Well, it runs on one GPU card with one chip, right? So, and it also depends, however many cameras you have and how big your output is, depends on how much memory you need on that GPU card. So, it'll, this, this code will run on any of our GPUs from low end to high end, but obviously if you're only, ha if you're trying to do 16 cameras in real time, for example, you're not going to run it on our low end GPU. Uh, but if you're running, say, four cameras and they're uh, 1080p each and you're just outputting 4K, you can run it on a, on a low end GPU. So our GPUs range from number of compute units down on a uh, APU that's uh, integrated, uh, you know, like about 10 compute units up to our high end, which is about 64. We, we have some that have two GPUs on a board, and they have like 72 and, and higher. Hey, yeah. Is the GPU or dedicated GPU? Yeah, could you repeat? Yeah. Any kind of GPU or any kind of GPU, what kind of performance for the GPU? Yeah, so the GPU that it runs on, right, depends on this number of cameras and everything that you're doing. So if it's an integrated uh, GPU on an APU, it'll run, say, a low-end kind of uh, application. If you're trying to do, say, 
16 cameras, 24 cameras, then you're going to need one of our high-end GPUs. What's the data flow management for this? So, I mean, it's sort of a, a whole hour presentation on how that actually works. But essentially, at the beginning, before we start the OpenVX graph, we basically pre-compute a lot of what's going to happen and where things are going to be laid out in the stitching. And then actually at runtime, when the OpenVX graph is running, it's essentially almost d doing sort of a dumb interpretation of what needs to go on. In other words, it's just doing certain things that it pre-computed that it needed to do. And then it does some very more complicated things like multiband blending, where it actually builds a Laplacian pyramid of the images and blends them together so you can do seam finding and feather the image across the seam so that you don't see that. So all the memory allocation and everything really happens way up front, right at the beginning. And then while when the graph is actually running per frame, you're really just, you're, you're not doing any memory management at all. Yes, in the back. Can you take one last yeah. I'm down to six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you had uh, several or many uh, user-defined kernels, so this might be a good time to ask. Um, OpenVX can fuse kernels. Can it fuse a user-defined kernel with a built-in, like, uh, within the OpenVX spec itself? Can it fuse those together into single nodes? So OpenVX, as per the spec, does not actually define that. It's up to each implementation. Right, and in our implementation, yes, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. so probably I can answer that. Oh. I think somebody else asked the same question. Yeah, right? yeah, it is. Yeah. What OpenVX spec specified is is a CPU host side user kernel if it runs on the host machine, and what we have is we have an extension for a user defined kernel which can generate an OpenCL code. So, during during the code verify graph. It gives you control. You can generate the code. It'll inject it into the pipeline. You could even generate a code, in, in fact, that it can fuse kernels in there, too. So it's, it's pretty flexible. You know, it's all limited license. You can go look at it. Feel free to look at it. You can make contributions, too. We'd love that. By the way, Rod is the chief architect of both the, our OpenVX implementation and our Loom implementation. So, <laughs> Yeah, one last question. Is there, there was, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, what is the real benefit or advantage of using OpenVX in this project? Uh, yeah, that, that's a real good question, and I get that from a lot of people like within AMD and other people that wonder why did we use OpenVX? Internal project dedicated to AMD uh, chipset. What is the benefit of using OpenVX? Yeah, the benefit of OpenVX really was primarily in raw performance that we're able to get in the short development product cycle. Like we could have done this some other way without using OpenVX, but using OpenVX allowed us to take advantage of all the things that we'd done in OpenVX to do graph optimization, a nice framework, uh, a good way to debug the code and to prototype it really quickly. We actually had the actual stitching proof of, we had to get the actual product ready for this movie on a really tight schedule. And we had to tell them, yes, we can do it. And, you know, it was doable. We had it all running in two or three months, the proof of concept, not the final code, but something that said, yeah, it's good enough that it, we can make it work and that we can shoot the movie on schedule, right? And we were really lucky. The movie slipped about a month, and so we got like an <laughs> extra month uh, to actually get it better. But it, it allowed us to actually, you know, meet the schedule. I just watched the YouTube video, it's super impressive, quite nice. Is this code something that we could use for, you know, just for um, uh, AMD, or can we use it? <laughs> it's open source MIT license, you can use it for whatever you want. And this, you know, the stitching that's going on in here has other applications besides VR. You could use it in automotive to get the picture around the car, uh, yes. like that. You have that's to be a little bit careful there from a safety point of view because since we're uh, manipulating, we have we, no liability to <laughs> Because we're blending things, you might not be seeing exactly the same thing, right, that actually is there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, for Mike. a very impressive work. Thank you. Hello. Hi. 
so uh, I guess probably from this workshop, people already know uh, OpenVX. So here I will introduce a uh, very silicon uh, OpenVX solution or implementation. A little bit the different uh, point of view, I guess uh, uh, the uh, previous uh, uh, vendors that they talk about the many for the uh, product, uh, software, uh, stack. Here just like a very silicon, a little bit different is uh, this one, the vision image processor. We really start this one, starting from OpenVX. This back to the 2014, uh, we have, uh, we were thinking how to redesign some uh, chip architecture for the vision and the compute. At that moment, uh, we we're looking for the standard. Uh, OpenVX 1.0 provisional was uh, 2014, around that time. So we found this spec and uh, realized that that could be a very good enable enabling tool uh, to start our processor. Also, from the embedded vision, Submit 2014, the keynote is about a convolutional neural network. So those two things inspired us, the team, the actually that moment is the wanted team to start a vision uh, image processor. So let me uh, first introduce a little bit of very silicon. Very, uh, Vivanti was acquired by very silicon last year. So this is about the whole very silicon. It's founded in 2001 and uh, six uh, plus, 650 plus uh, employees of the offices, uh, international office. And uh, pretty much the product line. Um, so this is quite a comprehensive product uh, yeah, package volume. Uh, so this is a vision Oh, this one. So, this one is the Vivanti Vision Image Processor. It's one of the product line. Ready? Okay. All right, so, sorry about that. Let's continue. So, this is the whole uh, very silicon product. Uh, Vision Image Processor is one of the product line. Uh, the full name is Vivanti Vision Image Processor. So this is the uh, this is about VIT right now. Uh, it's scalable from one core or even up to 16 cores, and uh, different use cases from VIP Nano uh, until today. Uh, they want to announce the new VIP 8000. This is the, the whole product. So the um, OpenVX and the OpenCL, the major software API to enable VIP processor. So this is uh, basically the, the uh, summary about the vision image processor product line. Uh, comparison. So this is uh, uh, the horizontal is the best performance and the power efficiency. The vertical is the best program program programmability. So uh, starting from it looks like the VIP versus the VIP efficiency uh, is uh, between the DSP and the customer RTL. Um, programmability is similar to the GPU. So because uh, right now we're using the API is similar to the GPU, OpenCL, uh, OpenVX, also with the uh, with compiler. So the architecture about the VIP 8000. So I'll, I, I can sp spend a little bit more time to explain here. So uh, let me try to, we don't have a laser right here, it is? So 2014, 
we start from here. At that moment, first we take a look at the, take a look at the open sale. We think this is from the uh, traditional GPU pipeline. We probably can optimize the GPU pipeline only for compute and vision by using OpenCL. So we started from there, and later on we realized that OpenVX is a better API uh, focused on the vision application. So we realized that we probably can also, this is not only for the, for the software point of view, we also optimize the hardware architecture for vision. So we added this vision instructions specifically for vision. So this is the starting point from 2014. We have a generic general purpose CL instructions, also highly optimized vision instructions. Put them together, we delivered OpenVX 1.0 solution and uh, passed the conformance. This is, uh, we also delivered this piece of uh, hardware and the software package as the first OpenVX, we uh, want the first OpenVX product to customer. And we compare the performance between the OpenCL and the OpenVX implementations. So almost, uh, in most of the case, we can see 5X or 10X difference, VX over uh, CL, general purposes uh, computing. So this is the starting point. But the whole structure, the architecture, it is still kind of like a graphics uh, element-wise uh, optimization. So that's, a, we call it a programmable engine, or we call it, a, right now we call it a PPU. Similar to shader, but it's different. <clears throat> Last year, well, actually, starting from 2015 and also the last year, we added a neural network engine because we realized the element-wise the architecture is not optimal for neural network. Neural network is about data flow and mainly for the uh, high-dimensional data structure, tensor. So we have to design something focused on the tensor itself. So we designed this. This is a you can see this is, a, you can think this as a tensor pipeline rather than the element pipeline. This is the big improvement. It has a slight window convolution or a matrix multiply for tensor. The basic structure for tensor is not element wise anymore. And also the tensor processor fabric for tensor. So the data movement it is focused on the tensor itself. Last year, we also added this, VIP Connect. Because when, as an IP, we want to have uh, more SOC to use our IP. And they probably have some um, fixed function already. So we want to allow their fixed functions inside the whole uh, IP. So we created this VIP Connect. Um, channel so that we can, from the, our command processor, command buffer, we can call their engine as well as an extension. This increases some flexibility. So this is three basic modules. It is the, the three basic modules for VIP A thousand series. So the first is the traditional basic element-wise uh, compute architecture. The middle one is advanced tensor neural network focused architecture. The third one is the flexibility for customer. Uh, it, can be it can be customized. So either you can take this one or take this one. I guess right now, the market is somebody, the customer will ask, only take this. And most of the customers will still combine this and this. Some customers will choose three. So this is the great architecture. So both performance, flexibility, uh, covered both traditional and uh, advanced neural network. 
Uh, this is uh, some slides about the use cases. Uh, probably we can skip. People are probably already familiar with this. Yeah, applications use most time is a surveillance camera, at a system. Uh, so product line, let's see the scale. Oops. Oops. So the horizontal, this vertical is traditional element-wise architecture. PPU, we call it the PPU, compute. This horizontal is a tensor. We call it an engine. So those two, you can combine flexibly. How many cores, it's independent. You can choose more. If you application focus more uh, traditional use cases, vision use cases, then pick more cores. If, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, if you neural network focus, then choose more. So this is basically the product setup. The use case, faster RCN, we deliver this uh, kind of performance. Uh, it is uh, almost real time. Uh, two, except for the hardware solution, we also provide a, a software uh, SDK. Uh, OpenVX, we have a driver, we have a compiler, because we have a, a vendor kernel, user kernel. To extend the user kernel, we need to use a CL-like language, plus specific uh, uh, vision instruction built in. So we have a dedicated comp compiler. Also, I want to mention we have a top of level two, we call it acuity. And then uh, most uh, important thing I want to mention is uh, acuity right now for the neural network extension, neural network solution. It can convert uh, the cafe or TensorFlow model directly to OpenVX function, API function call, an extension, or directly as a, a, a OpenVX graph, so that you can load this into the generic vision application. We have a, a IDE for programming debugging profiler. We have a simulator, and uh, this is the whole tool. Uh, this IDE looks like this is a one button network mapping. So you can see this is the model. Actually, we are also plan to support NEF. So that uh, I think NEF is another wonderful enabling tool to unify the a neural network description. So I guess uh, probably if this, is the, this is the time to end. Any questions? Any questions? Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Okay. So, maybe I can start with one question. So, I, I know there's multiple people mentioned that they were, you know, uh, already implemented some code generators. Tom? Yeah, come to it. And we'll. So, anyway, that, that code generation kind of business was a little bit of a surprise to me. So, so when I think of kind of like an open, uh, you know, a, a, a open, I don't know what to call it, let's say a, a, a standard API that, that, that is supposed to, you know, make things easy uh, and, and, and enable the, the NE programmer to harvest these, these cool capabilities of the, of, the, um, of the architecture. So the first thing that I'm thinking about is a code generator. That, that, that generates a massive amount of code uh, uh, that, that, you know, so wasn't the goal of all of them to, to, to make some, some symbol to write code, right? To, 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 so for, 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 for an unsophisticated user to take advantage of this capability. So the, the moment we, we are inserting code generators that, that produce a massive amount of code that are probably then very hard to read. So, so so, so let, let me just take a quick stab at them. Yeah, yeah. So I think you might be confusing two different kinds of code generators. So in one type, there's where you, you describe your graph, and then there's a code generator that creates the C code that 
actually creates your graph and, and does everything there. That's one kind of a cogenerator. Another kind is we have an individual kernel, right, for a node, and that kernel, say, is going to do a 7 by 7, blah, 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 something. And you might not have already handwritten that code, and you get a code fine, generator fine. that creates that yeah, my code, question is and you the, never see that. There's, 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 there's a total one. Oh, okay. There's a total one, I guess. <laughs> Which is somewhat as present from the neural network for that question, right? So if you try to look at the OpenVX specification, and if you see the first diagram that we have on the top of during the overview, you will see that OpenVX interfaces, one is you can write applications directly using OpenVX API, or you can have third-party ASV tools, layer, SDK layer, like, you know, like TISDK or somebody else's SDK, which uses OpenVX as a low-level layer to do it. And there are other tools which generate code, which uses OpenVX, but kind of the generate code, like the one that Norman was showing. It takes a AlexNet description from a protocol, and it generates open. It's not meant for human consumption, that code. It's meant just meant for underlying machine consumption. It, it basically, there's a lot of boilerplate Oh, not a lot, but there's some amount of boilerplate kind of code in order to construct a graph and do some of these things, and it's sort of mindless coding, and I think everyone probably has something that allows you to make that easier. Yeah, the thing that what happened is that we started with the C interface, and the C interface was because uh, not in, in many embedded devices, you don't always have good compilers, so C is very common. Uh, not everyone has a C++ or has a C++ compiler. So that's why we went to C. And, and the, the constraint of C made the code very, very big. That's why we need it. But it's still, what what this code shows, it shows the constraint which we have as a hardware. Uh, so it, it actually reflects, this is the hardware guy's code. This is how we want to see the interface. It's not a software guy. Software guy wants to see something more abstract, more like less lines of code. So to bridge the gap in the code generation or the higher level language, we should produce the computer as a code. I want to mention so basically the code, the generator, the code is just one which means it's not a very nice like uh, there is an constant. So basically, we can do code generate. But the, the ultimate goal is that just from the top level graph description to generate a very optimized hardware specific binary. You can load directly, mm -hmm. execute on your embedded device. That's the purpose. And in the middle, middle level, like API level, OpenVX has an export and import extension. You can generate a graph and uh, export, and then you can load it and import. So in that one, you can still uh, execute. That can avoid uh, some code generation. It's not really nice, to but it is just a one way to do it. I would, I would probably circle back to where Mike was coming from, the two kinds of code generations. Um, um, which you already described, so I won't go deeper into that. Uh, but on your point being, uh, the OpenVX is already you know, making it easy, so why wrap it with other layers? Um, I appreciate the uh, sentiment, but the information that we get from all our customers is you can never make anything easy enough. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Are there any uh, current uh, neural network training frameworks out there like TensorFlow or CAFE or CAFE2 or MXNet uh, that currently leverage OpenVX? Or, and it, if not, are there any publicly that you can disclose like, plans for one of those to be ported to use OpenVX? So OpenVX is going to be, a, it's not only a, a training framework really a, for inference, so it sort of consumes right. what, what those things put out. So actually there's a, you know, Intel has created a tool, and I, I guess Verisil can also, there's a tool to consume uh, the stuff from, from uh, so it's, it's, there's, it doesn't really like go the other way. We haven't, we haven't said, well, can you um, push your, somehow your, your OpenVX code into your tool? Uh, we haven't done that, but there are hooks um, that, say TensorFlow provides for you to have a, a various backends 
And it, it could be possible that there is such a back end that's open to X, but there's not that much. Yeah, one thing we probably want to mention is the uh, uh, OpenVX plus NDF. Uh, uh, that will be the Kronos uh, new network solution to, <coughs> to complete. So for the NDF point of view, uh, NDF defined a uh, uh, quantization, flexible quantization uh, approach. So uh, it's uh, more flexible than TensorFlow. And Cafe, even Cafe, right now the current Cafe is uh, not officially include any uh, quantization. So if you really want to train a uh, neural network in integer eight, so right now it's either you have to use the TensorFlow min max range quantization, or either you have to go through some private uh, cafe fork branch to do the cafe training. So NEF is uh, trying to flexible bus the quantization approach and uh, inc uh, make this a complete as a uh, exchange between the framework model descriptions and the embedded uh, uh, inference, so as a bridge. So then you have, uh, can have more, so you probably will see the in the next few months, then you have a little bit of so, uh, so I guess I can elaborate on the, the reason why I asked that as well is, um, so, and then, yeah, goes a long way to standardize on how to exchange the neural network, you know, the topology of it plus the weights and biases. But then if you hand that to someone and say, look, we did an awesome job here, you know, use it, immediately they're going to say, or want to verify it and see what the accuracy was. And, you know, all those frameworks already have the databases of all the images and the standard way of doing run cafe test or something like that, which would immediately output then you got, you know, 80, 90% accuracy kind of prediction for inferencing. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's why uh, Chronos uh, is also, like, even from the, our group, we are looking for some way to use OpenVX to accelerate the TensorFlow uh, compared to uh, so that uh, the framework can take advantage of the embedded device. They can run the test, run the inference test on the embedded device to get the accuracy number uh, immediately. So you don't have to wait and the board does want to give a simulation running on the framework of the CPU and put a feature. So we, we really want to see that. Uh, so with uh, yeah, and uh, with uh, OpenVX, we'll try to accelerate, accelerate the track. Hopefully uh, the standards uh, that we're doing in Kronos will help with some of that in terms of there's conformance tests. So there will be conformance tests for the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the neural network extension. And the NMEF now is just a format. And we said there's going to be another layer on for the API for how to manipulate that. But that API will have a conformance test too. And so you'll at least be able to say, you know, if I'm writing this, I, I know what I, I should expect to get because my implementation passes the conformance test. So, so how to resolve memory capacity issue? If a model is uh, bigger enough so that it cannot fit in memory, we would do that. Any, 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 any sort of... Uh, uh, you talking about a neural net model? Yeah, of course, yeah. Model, you know, it's a uh, model to be so cannot fit even in the actual memory. What do you do with that? So you already in network, new network execution as the inference is a layer by layer. So for this layer, after this layer, you don't need the weight on the bias for this layer anymore. So you probably can switch. But either way, so we have a way how to comprise, and uh, uh, this is a good question, so we have to comprise the memory. Uh, like float 32, that's a big memory for, uh, footprint. But back to the hardware specific uh, vendor implementation, like a pure silicon, because we're using the integrate eight, it's pretty small. And also, um, we have uh, some prone uh, strategy. So the model could be just a uh, uh, live stand uh, one tenth of the original model, even smaller. So you have, we have some long time compression. So just you don't you don't need that as a that big memory. Are you talking about single mode or I'm talking about cluster mode, which is a discrete cluster mode. Uh, 
but in a classroom, it's not a single chip or a single board. It's a classroom. So, mm -hmm. so model could be very big. It's not just uh, I don't think that. Uh, so, so even not a, even not talking about the data, the model could be big. So if the model big, then, you know, forget about on chip memory. Even off chip memory cannot hold uh, that model. Yeah. So, well, so, sorry, so there, there are two yes. kinds of parallel, right? Data parallel yes. and the model parallel. I'm talking about that. So we yeah. do we do have a view on that. I think that that's a good good point. Um, you, you know, we talked about different devices in the family, at least for Texas instruments. Um, and each device comes with its own um, system architecture issues in terms of how much external memory it can support. Um, and what we end up doing is, depending upon what is your model and what problem is you're trying to solve, you will have to pick the right device. Uh, and there might be models for which we don't yet have it. That scenario is absolutely possible. I don't think that will be true for AMD. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we are coming out with graphics chips that have an SSD drive on the graphics chip. Yeah. With terabytes of memory. That, so if you're going to run out of terabytes, then really, the problems. But no, it comes down to the same problems we've all been working on for our whole careers for you know decades, right? You got to make your program fit into the device that you pick to run it on, right? I mean, and so it's up to the, each individual vendor that actually produces an implementation to basically do all the best optimization they can to reduce the memory footprint and everything, and then provide some kind of benchmarks or specifications to say, this is the size of model you can run on this device. Yeah, yeah if, if, it, if the model is too big, and the optimization can break it into several parts and run it one after the other, just to see one. This is all new. Okay, so the optimization so can be happened to all. But let me have much longer to be this. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, you do that right off. No free lunch. No free lunch. The point is, thing is it's, you, we try to do a great detail in automation. Yeah. That means you have this graph, you, you put what is your algorithm. And now, if you run this algorithm on the device, we'll try to do it in an automatical way, find the best way to run it on this device. Okay, so now, of course, if you see the device doesn't fit your requirement then you probably need another device. That that you, you will not you will not ignore it. You will not solve it that but there's also the compression protocol. I don't know you can update it in the standard form. Yeah. You can compress and decompress but again it takes time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah there's there are many techniques to uh, reduce the, the footprint of the memory and one of the common way is uh, you take the away in quantize, right? So I think that it's what you need, the, it's a consequence that you're going to separate some accuracy, right? So, and there's also techniques that you can take away and actually trim it, right? Some of the smaller way you can force it to zero. You mean reduce a bit? <coughs> reduce a bit, and yes, so you reduce the number of coefficients. So let's say you do some coring on the, on the weight, right? So you, for example, if uh, the weight is less than 0.01, right? you say, you call that zero. Okay. So basically, those weights disappear. So you can have a very smart encoding scheme right, to encode the coefficient, right? So I see. I don't know where you went to the, you know, the the region summit uh, on Monday and Tuesday. So there's a uh, many techniques, right? So I saw example. They can take a very large network, right, and do all kind of optimization. <coughs> so in the end, you can run the whole network on on the phone. Okay. So that's you know, the kind of uh, but it's going to take a lot of work, right? You cannot take the cafe floating point model and implement as it, and, and you're going to go to production with that, with that kind of model. That's not going to work. Okay? So they're going to have a lot of effort you have to spend to optimize the model. Okay? So that, that's, you can gain most of your pain off the path from, from just the architecture optimization. Right? If, if you look at uh, the talk that Paul Brasnett from Imagination gave at the Embedded Vision Summit, he covered a number of techniques in that for yeah. optimizing in terms of uh, reducing the bit depth, uh, reducing the zip, making more zero coefficients and getting rid of those. So 
I'd refer you to that to have a look at a lot of techniques there. Yeah. And as you say, there's, there's many techniques and, many things techniques, correct. and things like retraining after you've reduced it, you can actually get the accuracy to be very close to uh, non optimized. Yeah, within 1%. Yeah. So, so they can reduce a 10x just by doing the, the, the stuff I'm talking about. Okay, one megabyte coefficient that you reduce to one tenth of that. And you also look at the data between layers. Almost at least half of the data is zero because of this uh, nonlinear, you know. That, 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 that depends on use case. I just want to go back to Two more minutes. I think we talked enough on this topic. If there's any other question, otherwise we'll come back to it. Yeah, uh, I wonder if there is any plan to uh, provide a better interface between OpenCV and OpenDF. We have a lot of uh, uh, development in the process or even in production of new OpenCV, so it would be easier to provide such interface, like uh, to convert uh, CV back to uh, OpenDF or something like that. Or, well, that's well, actually, we showed some of that code today. <laughs> so. So there's basically what you you, you get that uh, CV map and then you basically create this address data structure and then you can use that to, to create the, the OpenDX. So we do do have that. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, just, you, you're going to have to do at least that when you, when you hand off, off data. Yeah, yeah, you don't need a standard to do that one. I think with the existing standard, you can map those data structures back and forth. And the one that Mike was talking about is we just created a open CV functions below and you wrap them, you know, the yes, one that the client is starting about and you just have open CV on the top, you're trying to exchange data between open CV and open VX. Yeah. There's also other possibility that you can have an open CV using open VX as an acceleration layer. All these are possible. I think do you need to do anything in open VX standard to make anything possible? I, I haven't heard a compelling case for that yet. But if there's a case, we will get it. Yeah, current open CV open source that has the open data forever. So many of the present presentations included the, the optimizations really that happen around the runtime side. So that's the vendors take care of that. What kinds of recommendations other than just reducing data types from you know a 16 bit to 8 bit um, would you recommend to get good performance in open VX like uh, if you're executing a graph, do you always want to add a node to the graph, which is actually also uh, spatially local to that node? Well, I guess if you ask from a developer, one thing you should do is just say first make all the objects virtual. Yes. <laughs> make, make it no op. You just keep the input and output. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. I think there are a few techniques. I think we kind of went through this in the right cycle. Right? So there's a, that technique. Um, what else? What else? Yeah. Yeah. If the well, implementation supports multiple targets, then you can play around with the scheduling by setting the affinity of those targets for different nodes. That would be kind of a more advanced <coughs> scheduling and, technique. And obviously, just the graph construction, make sure your graph just doesn't have extraneous stuff in it, right? I mean, try to make, you know, try to understand a little bit about what's going on inside of the different nodes so that when you create a graph using those nodes, you're actually picking from the things that make the most sense. And or you can pick from things that are very low level basic because then anyone that does graph optimization is going to fuse those things all together and save a lot. And if you had multiple graphs and you've got nodes that are basically the first three nodes of all these graphs are doing the same thing, obviously that's one thing that can be combined. You know, whether it's that or something else, combining the graphs can give the optimizer up more opportunities to take advantage of some parallel. And I think like the tools that I showed, I think probably pretty much everyone's got that kind of tool. You can look at the, you know, how the, when it's actually operating, what's the utilization of the GPU and the CPU, and you can then see quite clearly where the bottlenecks are and try to work around those to design. One thing we didn't talk about today, there's an extension called the user tiling extension. I don't know who's implemented that. It's an optional, it's an extension, but uh, it allows you, if you're writing a user node, normally you just, Basically, you can have the whole image on a regular user. Uh, but if you uh, use this timing extension, then you, in addition to 
giving uh, OpenVX the function to use, you also tell it some, some information about the data access pattern of that function. So you can say, in order to compute this output pixel, I need these nearby input pixels and, and that sort of thing. And if you provide that information to the, the implementation, then it can do uh, tiling for you as well. So you can still take advantage of that kind of optimization uh, with your user. Yeah, and that's very key to understand because most chips have some kind of cache or scratch bed memory and it's some certain size and you want to get a tile to fit into that size and then those tiles all run much yeah, on, I, on the order of like 10 hours. Yeah. I, I, I'd say all architectures. Yeah. <laughs> and people say, you know, well, I'll just use the cache. Well, that doesn't work quite so well. The cache behavior on these large image uh, operations is not going to help you so much. And, and, and even if you have you know, a fairly sophisticated cache, and maybe a fairly large cache, uh, doing some kind of tiling type uh, operation is going to help you out and, and, and get you, you know, two, three extra spots in that, even on a um, uh, cache CPU part. Yeah, I remember people, some, a lot of people use cache as a local memory. You just allocate a buffer of some size and then you just load it into that thing. So, so what is the biggest challenge for this uh, whole flow automation? I don't know what you guys are doing. It's not the kind of mentor they can also do it, right? Or any com compiler vendor they can also do it. So what is the biggest challenge for this neural network specification for code generation? So I'm not, not sure if I got your whole question, but when you said any compiler vendor can do it, of I would yeah, any vendor can I, do it. I would argue that any compiler vendor can't do what OpenVX graphs can do because when the, when the optimizer like looks at your whole graph, it can it sees like your whole program and can figure out how to optimize it. Whereas compilers are only looking at a handful of instructions and a couple of functions. They don't really get to see what functions coming before this or after this. So, I, I, I so it's a combination of good compilers and good whole graph. Uh, it's, a, it's not a lot of science. It's more of a domain specific. Yeah, 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 it's it's specifying. Specific knowledge about computer vision, specific knowledge. Yeah. What's the language that describes that? Yeah. It's a disaster. Yeah. And you can also apply some accelerator or hardware accelerator below, which is uh, something which the compiler might not see. Yeah, that, that would be the key to ensure that. It's like uh, NVIDIA? They have well, like NVIDIA or like any other. Okay. I'm sure everybody has some sort of hardware acceleration going on. Now, the key is, I, I'm not sure whether general purpose compiler vendors will have information or knowledge about how to utilize that particular piece of the uh, silicon. Or open source. Possible. Or open source. Knowledge is open. <laughs> anyway, very impressive. I, I think we should stop at that because a lot of people have to go catch flights. Yeah. So, thank you all. Thanks for coming. So we're going to post all the slides on Kronos website. So if you have any questions, including presentations and if you have questions feel free to send us email or I suggest put question on the forum from the forum not to the past so other people can participate huh? yeah I will put the forums.chronos.org yes yeah, we